folks, and welcome to The Daily Coin. My name is Rory, and today is Friday, February the 26th, 2016, and I have the great honor and pleasure of welcoming back to the show the founder and CEO of Sprott Asset Management, and that is Mr. Eric Sprott. How you doing today, Eric? Hey, Rory. I'm doing well. Uh, we've had an interesting week uh, a little disappointing to see a little fade here on Friday, but uh, lots of good things happening in the precious metals market. Yes, there is. And I wanted to start with something that I believe is near and dear to your heart, and that's the uh, silver mining. And with several of the primary silver miners reporting record production for 2015, especially the ones out of um, Mexico, Silver Standard, Hecla, a couple of the others as well, how much longer do you believe that this is sustainable uh, into 2016, or is it at all? Well, I would I would guess that all mining production uh, of precious metal, and for that matter, any metal, uh, will decline in 2016. I, I can speak more to gold and silver. I know gold came down some small percentage in the fourth quarter. As we all know, the the money being invested in exploration and development has come off here. Uh, so I would certainly think that uh, production is likely to go down. And notwithstanding what might have happened, I think Mexican production actually in the whole is going to be down last year. You know, the U.S. production is down, Canadian production down. I think silver production, when we finally get the numbers for 2015, we'll find out that it was down okay. uh, year on year. And I suspect that uh, we'll find out it's going to be down uh, again, in 2016, as the year unfolds, and we realize that not too many new operations are opening up here. So, I, I think from a supply point of view, both in gold and silver, 2016 looks to be a real positive year on the supply side in the sense that we'll get less supply than uh, than last year. How are they going to be able to manipulate the price when the product is going away? And the demand is going through the roof. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a very interesting conundrum. But it's not one that we haven't faced before, Rory. You know, my view has been that for a number of years now, that the physical demand that we can see has always been about the mine and scrap supply. And that the difference was um, made up by central banks leasing their gold out. So they don't actually say they're selling it. It still shows in their balance sheet as gold, even though it's leased out, but it has made the difference. And as we look at markets here in 2016, we've had some stunning uh, numbers, if we're to believe the ETF numbers. And um, I know so far in uh, February, I mean, we've added something like 160 tons so far in February, and I think we're at something like uh, 240 tons uh, or maybe 220 tons. Uh, through to uh, earlier this week. And um, I kind of look at, uh, and, and w- the one thing I'm a little concerned about, some e- I, I just don't know whether ETS really do get the goal. Like I'm, I'm a little bit um, from Missouri on whether the, the gold ETF or the GLD actually receives the goal or they get some promise to receive the goal. But, but let's presume that they do. Um, I mean, we have... Uh, so far, I had about 100 tons a month of gold coming into the world's ETFs. If I can annualize that, it's a 1,200 tons uh, of gold purchases this year just for ETFs. Wow. And last year, they sold 138 tons. So you have a total delta there of 1,338 tons in what's a 4,000 ton market, which was in balance last year. So where do you come up with an extra 1,300 tons to satisfy that one? change in demand, let alone the fact that coin sales are exploding and uh, there's obviously people are buying bar and you can just feel what's going on on the gold arena outside of ETFs here. So it's, in my mind, the physical numbers are absolutely stunning so far this year. And, and to your question, you know, how are they going to keep it down? Well, of course, they can keep it down by, by issuing paper on the various commodity exchanges, particularly COMEX and people not taking delivery. Um, but the amount of tonnage left on the, uh, in the COMEX is like, I think it's eight or nine tons, nine tons, nine. We had two days this week when the ETF added 19 tons in a day. We wow. have a total of eight tons sitting in the COMEX that's uh, registered 
and available for delivery. So sooner or later, it's going to spill in there. Uh, I look at what's happened not so much this week, but today that it's, it's come off here on Friday that they're setting up the LBMA, I think it's probably even more egregious in some of its pricing actions than the COMEX is. Well, we got, we got options expiry in, uh, in, on the LBMA on Monday. I really do believe they're after the, the silver market here. It's had by far a bigger decline than gold. Um, because the, the, the position in silver is somewhat untenable. And we have 800 million ounces short on the COMEX. God knows what we have short. In the in the option markets uh, over in uh, over in Europe, uh, and meanwhile we get in the COMEX we get 25 million ounces of silver available against an 800 million pound short position. So I believe that the commercials do maneuver the price down to where uh, the option writer, the option buyer, sorry, uh, have max pain. And there's a theory, and they close that max pain. And here we have uh, silver down uh, well under. Uh, Fifteen dollars here, uh, and I would have guessed that you know where is Max Payne? Max Payne's probably about you know fourteen seventy five, something like that, <laughs> where all the, the put and call guys end up losing all their premiums, and the commercials make them all. It's a bit of a game where they just sweep the table, you know, every uh, every six to twelve weeks, just as as the options expire, and then they rake in the option premiums. So I think post Monday. Things could be very exciting. We've had lots of positive news, both on the silver front and on the gold front. And perhaps one of the things that people should reflect on here, you know, so many uh, different either technical guys or um, gold experts at at various uh, banks have now come out in favor of gold, including some of the bigger banks. And I always find it almost hilarious that the, the amount of gold that's available each year increases by approximately 2,700 tons, which is the amount mined. You can't count recycling because it already existed. So you get 2,700 tons added to a total of 175,000 tons that, that already exist. I mean, it's only a 1.5% increase. So, you know, if, if let's say people own 1% of gold in their portfolios, it can only go to 1.01.5% the next year. There's only 1.5% more gold. So, all these people are saying, well, you know, increase your weighting in gold from 5 to 10 or 10 to 20. But that is absolutely impossible to do when there's very little increase in supply each year. So exactly. with all these new new entrants coming into the market, like we're all trying to fit through a very, very small door here. Yes. I, I know that's right. I mean, we were, we were looking at some numbers uh, similar to that, Eric, just the other day, and, and – I was speaking with uh, Dave Kranzler about it, and he was saying, you know, if it goes up, if the demand, the current demand goes up from just under 1% to 5%, and I said, no, if it goes up to, from just under 1% to 1.5% of investors, then we have, we have an issue. We have a major issue. Yeah. And... There's, there's no doubt. There's no doubt mathematically, Rory, you're absolutely correct, right? I mean, to go from one to one and a half, you need 50% more. Exactly. Well, we produce one and a half percent more a year. You can get 50% more by having the price go up by 50%. That's the only way you can do it, right? Right. It, 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 there's a very, very small amount of new gold added every year to the investment pools that people can uh, put their money in. Now, as far as... How does that play out uh, in your mind, Eric, as far as, or according to your analysis, I should say, with silver? Because silver, as you well know, it's not hoarded in mass. The, the majority of what's mined is used. So if it's used and we have, we use the same numbers that we were just discussing. We go from 1% to 1.5%. What what happens yeah. to silver at that point? I mean, because there's nowhere yeah. to go get it. Yeah, I agree, uh, Rory. I think silver is is the uh, the dark horse here, and uh, because one because of the positioning of the commercials, uh, two the fact that most, as you say most demand is industrial. When I look at the eight billion that's gone into uh, gold funds this month, I mean you couldn't begin 
to get that into silver um, in a year. So, you know, it's only 25,000, uh, 25 million ounces of silver in the Comex. I mean, that's, that's worth maybe $400 million. You'd clean out the Comex. Wow. Uh, it, and most silver, well, I don't even think 20% of silver is available for investment. So that's 160 million ounces a year. That's not a lot of money. No, and, it's not. Uh, when you compare it to the amounts of money, you know, floating around in the world, it's a very, very small market. So I think when, when the, um, the shortage happens and maybe when people, you know, maybe some people shift from gold to silver, silver is going to way outperform gold here. Every, every time I have to look at the, uh, the U.S. Mint's uh, gold and silver sales so far this month. I think gold sales they'll probably end up about ninety thousand ounces, something like that. And silver will be pushing uh, pushing six million ounces. Well, that's a difference of f- over fifty times more silver is purchased than gold, and yet it's produced in a, at an eleven to one ratio. And most of the silver produced is for is not for it's for uh, industrial demand. So. I mean, the ratio of what's available for investment is probably like uh, one of every five ounces, or it's probably five ounces of silver versus an ounce of gold. And um, but they're buying at a rate of, of fifty to one. Well, I can't carry on. <laughs> no. We're going to run out of silver. And and as you very well know, I mean, essentially the mint is restricting silver sales already. Exactly. Right? And they they go at a very very slow pace and. Uh, but I think the demands there, uh, the logic is there. That's the big, I think that's the most supported case for us. The logic for owning uh, precious metals in, you know, zero interest rate or negative interest rate, uh, banning of cash, uh, levered banks, bank stocks, you know, losing massive amounts of money. There were three bad reports this week. Uh, one was at uh, Royal Bank of Scotland today. Standard Chartered the other day and HSBC the day before that, they all lost huge grabs of money. Uh, plus they're levered. So I, I, I just think that the demand will continue to come in here. And, and notwithstanding what the commercials try to do in the paper markets, honestly, it can't um, sustain itself on a long-term basis. There's just no way that we will deplete those inventories in, in those exchanges. Yes, we will. And I, I want to stay with this for just a minute, but I do, I, I've got a question on cash and the cashless society. But on January 28th, we witnessed one of the most blatant acts of fraud in recent memory when the silver fix broke. It literally broke, and there was an 80 cent difference between the futures cost and the spot cost. And what are your thoughts, Eric, on the silver fix collapse that happened that day? Yeah, uh, yeah sure. All I can say is that somebody just rigged it, right? Somebody had obviously had some option contract that was maturing that day, and he had to get the price down to a certain level so he could, he could cause his client to lose money and him to make money. And it, it was just egregious what happened, and there was no explanation for it. I mean, it was just, it's like being in fantasy land. It was so surreal, you know. 80 cents away, but 5% away from the market. Like, what the hang is going on here? Exactly. And ultimately, you know, I'm glad to see some of the producers were complaining. In fact, some of the producers quit the LBMA. I think there were four or five major producers just outright quit the LBMA because it's, it's rigged. And it, it's just amazing the um, aggressiveness and greed and uh, just willingness to throw caution to the winds and just at their whim make the price whatever they want to make it. Uh, and, and nobody, and there's no, no, no uh, reaction amongst the regulators or the exchanges, anything like that. It's just sort of, well, we just another day in, in space here. Um, but I think it's symptomatic of, in my mind, it's more symptomatic of the short position in silver that somebody had to get at the price at that level that day to avoid a major loss. Um, but that, that can't, you know, you, you can't keep manipulating markets like that when the underlying physical uh, data is so, so overwhelmingly supportive of prices going up. Yes, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. And will we finally see the Shanghai futures market come online on April the 9th? And if so, what does that mean 
to the coordinated fixes on the COMAX and LBMA, especially in light of what we were just talking about? Yeah, it's, it's a very difficult question for me to answer, Rory. I just don't okay. know um, what happens in those markets. You know, the, the new ABX market opened up, I think it was uh, a week ago this Wednesday. And it's, I, and I, like, I don't see the data yet. Uh, and it was supposed to have some some impact on pricing and, and may very well have had an impact on pricing, but it, it's not something that I can measure yet. Okay. Uh, I mean, obviously, as you, as you well know, the gold market is in Asia <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> yes. Uh, although it's kind of shifting here now with the kind of tonnages that theoretically being bought here. I mean, these are massive tonnages. I mean, there's hardly, I mean, yes, sometimes China can import 200 tons in a month, which is a very, very, very big month. Well, you know, the ETF's doing almost 200 this month, almost makes those two markets the same size here. Uh, and of course, India can be counted on for their hundred tons a month or something a little less than that every month. So that's where the real market is, and I hope that um, the reality of the physical markets comes to bear, but I don't really, I can't, I can't give you a professional opinion on it because I'm okay. just not I don't know the intricacies of the market yet, and I, you have to see it play out. And a lot of these uh, promised exchanges, you know, they say they're going to happen, and then they seem somehow seem to get delayed. So I, I don't think we have to rely on those markets to to know that there's going to, there is a shortage developing here. You just can't you just look at the ETF stats. You know, where is this gold possibly coming from? You know, it has to be coming from central banks, and of course. One day, because it's been happening for so long, you're just going to say, okay, the gig's up here. Everybody's buying gold, and we're not going to win this, and away she goes. So that's what I'm hoping for, that, that someday, you know, they just throw in the towel and say, we're not going to, we're not going to supply this market anymore. We've got to let it go. We can, we're all waiting for that day. <laughs> And as we've, we've seen, been waiting a long time for that day. <laughs> <laughs> well, then that means we're another day closer. <laughs> we are indeed. <laughs> and uh, Eric, we were talking about the cashless society just a minute ago. You had alluded to it. And as we've seen the past couple of days, the Japanese have been hoarding cash. They've been buying all the safes that they can get the get their hands on and stashing yeah. cash at home. Yeah. And if one, if a, yeah. if, if I. If someone holds physical gold and silver, does a cashless society matter? And should we be concerned about the government eliminating hard cash? Well, in a way, Rory, you know, it's a quite a positive for us in the precious metals area, right? Because it's a choice of two things, taking the cash out of the bank, which you should have done anyway, because the exactly. banks are very risky places to, that you should have your money and you're an unsecured creditor. So I would never recommend having money in a bank anyway. Uh, and if you can, you know, put it in a, a safety deposit box or a, or your own uh, home safe, then fine, then go ahead and do that. But of course, the, the offset to that is, most uh, currencies in the world are going down in value. So if you're in one of those countries, do you really want to own the cash? Because its purchasing power is going down all the time. So I would think that that would cause people to reflect on owning precious metals. And as we discussed, it doesn't take much of an increase in buying <laughs> to, to really exacerbate a shortage, right? You, you can't just imagine the size of bank deposits Versus the size of the gold market. I mean, it's the gold market so minuscule versus bank deposits. You could see, you know, just a gigantic uh, rush to own gold. Uh, particularly if we can start putting in some um, some upward bias in gold here in the short term, because everyone's memories date back to the last four years, and they're forgetting the last six thousand years. Right. And and of course they're forgetting the the eleven years before that when gold went up by uh, over 500%. It's all sort of a distant memory, it seems. Um, I always ask people to think, you know, if, you, if you're out in your backyard and, and you discovered something that someone buried uh, uh, 100 years ago, and one, he buried some notes, some um, fiat currency, and the second, he buried some gold, I will guarantee you the gold will have gone up by 
you know, 10, 20, 50 times, of course, the money's still only worth what the money's worth. <laughs> and it just, it's, it just tells you what the passage of time does to fiat currencies. Uh, I, I can't believe that people don't learn from history in a way, but all fiat currencies have ended up being valueless. And I think it's safe to say we can look at the world today as logical thinkers. This stuff's going to end up being valueless too. Yes. All these countries are broke. They're all they're, broke. They're so verifiably broke that why, why would you trust the currency of the country? So uh, it, it's uh, frustrating that it hasn't evolved quicker, but you, it's, it's all going the same way. Well, for me, it comes down to do you trust the government? I mean, and if anybody <laughs> says yes, then, then I'm, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I always look at that equation of government equals trust. And then you put the line through the equal sign. <laughs> exactly. We trust the government. <laughs> I mean, because that's what that and that's what it comes down to, isn't it, Eric? I mean, do you trust the government to it, to handle your I, currency? Yeah. I, I don't. I mean, yes, yeah. and and it's not even you know people might think, well, how can you not trust people? But it's the fact that the government and and and, and the U.S. government might be the most egregious example of this is they understate their liabilities, right? right? They don't say that they're not going to be able to pay Social Security and Civil Service Pension Fund and nada, nada, nada. But they can't. I mean, mathematically, it's going to be impossible for them to make these payments. And uh, didn't we just see, we saw last week that 400,000 members of some union are being informed that their pensions are going to be cut by 50%. Exactly. Well, you know what, Americans? Get ready for it because it's going to happen to Social Security too, yep. and lots of corporate pension plans. Yep. But we all, you know, we don't want to deal with what we can see in the future, even though we can see it very clearly. Well, I mean, look at Detroit. What did they do to their yeah, pensioners? Look at Detroit. I mean, it, it's it's terrible. Totally. You know, I mean, and and that's just a small sample of what's coming on a national level. Period. It has to. Because there's no there's no funding for it, no funding, and imagine the returns this last year and this year. You know, Treasury's yielding nothing. Now all your your corporate and high yield bonds have gone down in value sharply. Stocks are down. What's the return going to be in a pension fund this year when you when you bogey seven or eight percent and you come out and you make nothing? It's just it's a massively increase of the underfunding. So yep. uh, there's just no solution to it. There's no mathematical solution. It's the most predictable thing in the world that there will be a failure to deliver on the promises. So, yep. and that goes to the trust no, and nobody talks about it. <laughs> it's right in front of our eyes. It's like the elephant in the room. Nobody notices it, but it's right there. It's that giant gray thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Swing on his truck. Oh, it just hit you. Oh, you, you, did you notice it? No, I didn't notice that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, last question, Eric. Then I'll let you get back to your uh, to your morning there. And are central banks out of ammo, and are they losing control? Well, I think it looks like they are, really. I find it so ironic that, you know, the Japanese... Uh, central bank, but they go to negative interest rates and their yen would weaken and their stocks would rally and exactly the opposite thing happened. I mean, it was so in your face. So in your face. Like they thought it would be a constructive thing and it ended up being destructive. And of course, from a logistical point of view, you go to negative interest rates. How do people create wealth? <laughs> you, know, you ask people to say it all their lives and now they're going to tell you, because you're a saver, you're going to pay in more every year. I mean, it's just, it's so cockamamie that uh, it's hard to believe we've gone here. And I think, uh, you know, to the, to the point of your question, the central banks are desperate to do something. You know, they, they think they can change the, the economy of the world, and in some ways they can. So, for example, when rates go to zero, you know, people can more more people can afford to buy a house, more people can afford to buy a car. But hey, once you get to a certain level, you can't bring the last sucker in, right? Right. And you've got everyone loaded up to their gills. They, you know, their monthly paycheck is almost totally allocated before they even receive it. And at that point, you have no buying power. They keep 
trying, but it's it's not working. And I would say that what the central banks have done is they've sustained the economy by low rates, but there's been no growth whatsoever. And now that rates can't go any lower, I think the gig is up here. And we'll, we'll see what will happen to the economy. We have so many bad reports recently with the services index contracting and house sales down 10% and all the CEOs or the, the consumer confidence going down, the Bloomberg Consumer Comfort Index going down, um, people's paychecks not going up. I just had to read that in, in Japan, the unions have decided they wouldn't even ask for a pay raise this year because of the difficulties in the, uh, in the Japanese economy. So, and, and, of course, there is inflation, which is most uh, people would suggest there isn't, but there is. And um, the policies, to your question, I believe are failing here. Yeah. And more and more people realize it every day. So we have no way of sustaining ourselves without fiscal policy. But we can't have fiscal policy when the deficits are, are as high as they are. So I think we're kind of at the end of the world. <laughs> In terms of uh, getting the economy to, um, what's the word? Um, Respond. It's, it's <laughs> breakout speed. It's just some kind of breakout speed. There's some word to use that, you know, it's going to get a certain volume. Well, it's not happening, so don't we shouldn't uh, hold our breath on that one. Well, I mean, we could uh, almost argue that our not just the U.S. economy is in contraction, but the global economy is in contraction. If you look at certain indices, and one of my favorite is the BDI, along with the Shanghai Containerized Freight Index, those things fell off a cliff about 14, 15 months ago. They've never recovered. They are a great indicator of manufacturing because it represents raw materials and finished goods. And if you aren't if you if you have no raw materials moving and you have no uh, finished goods moving then what have you got you got nothing so yeah I mean you're, it's you're absolutely right Rory. I mean the worst data is the data out of Asia when when you look at Japanese imports and exports and Chinese and South Korea and they're all down double digits exactly I mean it's a, just a mess over there and that's not a recession by the way that's almost a depression so it's it's just not happening and, how can anybody expect to ship more into the United States when people's incomes don't go up, but their expenses do go up, notwithstanding <laughs> the CPI? I don't believe the CPI for a second, but yeah. everyone's costs are going up, but their wages aren't going up. So you can't buy more goods, plus you're tapped out on your credit lines. There you go. So it's, it's not good economically, uh, which feeds into, of course, the concern in the banking area, right? That you have borrowers who might have a very, very difficult time repaying. And all the more reason for uh, depositors to be concerned about some potential future bail-in. And get out of the system and get into your own uh, gold and silver where you're now the counterparty. Right. Of some bank being the counterparty. Be your own central bank. <laughs> be your own central bank. Yes, sir. That's it. Well, Eric, I think that's a, a fairly positive note for us to leave everybody on. And we've been speaking with Mr. Eric Sprott, who is the founder and CEO of Sprott uh, Asset, Sprott Management. There's a whole list of uh, Sprott companies that he is the, in charge of. And Eric, I certainly appreciate all your time today. Well, Rory, it's always enjoyable. And, uh, you know, I've always been thankful of the work that uh, you and others do in this area because, uh, Someone has to uh, put the facts on the table and uh, give people a proper advice. And I'm sure, you know, in, in, in the medium and long run, owning precious metal, even going back 10 years ago, is the best investment in, of all time. And it still is in my mind. And we're going to see a lot more of that action this year. We certainly are. I would agree with that wholeheartedly. And Eric, I look forward to speaking with you again in the not too distant future. And you have a wonderful morning. Okay, Rory. All the best to you. All right, buddy. Bye-bye.